Hello everyone. Chapter 24 of No Man Knows My History is about polygamy and as such it's a pretty it's a pretty heavy read. There are some difficult things for sure. We know from Brigham Young he says I myself sealed dozens of women to Joseph and Fawn Brody says that um, pretty confidently that there's about 36 and then she lists 49 women by name. So 36 uh, she feels really confident about and then the rest she names as people that were very likely married to Joseph if, if for no other reason than to uh, seal their family dynastically to Smith. There was a belief in Nauvoo at the time that um, if you could get sealed to Joseph then your family would, it's, it's kind of like a second anointing if you know what that is where these people are basically guaranteed if you're sealed to Joseph then you are in good shape in the afterlife and so there are people who believe that there were women and families sealed to Joseph for no other purpose than for that reason so no um, sex involved but of course this chapter makes it very clear that while there were some people that uh, probably were not having sex with Joseph Smith it's safe to say that many of them were, uh, some of them we have absolute con confirmation that they were, and the rest of the, we have speculation that they were. It's kind of a mess, uh, to the point where the Reformed Church of, um, the, the church that split off when Brigham Young became president, and the, the people who did not accept that and ended up following the actual posterity of Joseph Smith himself as the leaders of the church, that sect of Mormonism, um, I think to this day, it, it, well, maybe recently, I'm not sure, but uh, up until very recently, if not to present day, they have continued to deny and provide apologetics for um, Joseph Smith not having practiced polygamy, as this chapter lays out pretty abundantly. And so, obviously, the data is a mess. Uh, I think it's really fair to say that if he was committing adultery with Fanny Alger in a barn while they were living in Kirtland and she was his orphaned maid living in their home, um, it's say, I, I think personally, my, my opinion, the inference I've drawn is that he was absolutely sleeping with, um, I, I would be comfortable saying at least half of the women he married polygamously were truly married in every sense of the word uh, and then I'm willing to accept that there were exceptions who were married to him really only in name only and, and didn't actually practice any of the um, sex or housework or anything else you would associate with uh, being a spouse. Uh, he married five pairs of sisters. That's insane. Can you imagine? And he married uh, Patty and Sylvia Sessions, who were a mother and daughter. He married several women under the age of 20, and there were a few of them under the age of 18, uh, including one or two that were the age 15. I always heard that Helen Mark Kimball was 14. It may be that she was 14 when he proposed and 15 by the time they got married. Suffice it to say, do you know any 14-year-old girls? Uh, do you have a daughter? Do you have a niece? Do you have uh, a student that you teach? If you know anyone, male or female or otherwise, that is 14 years old, that is an insanely young age to be married. There's many apologetics that are put forth to explain away and uh, make it seem like that wasn't such a big deal in Joseph Smith's time. And while it is true that there were more people under the age of 18 that got married in the 19th century, it, um, it almost is 100% of those couples were people who were the same age. So like a 16-year-old marrying a 15-year-old wouldn't have been as abnormal because people died younger, etc., etc. But uh, a 40-year-old uh, a man, 38-year-old man marrying a 14-year-old has never in the Western world um, in the last few centuries been considered normal or acceptable. Considering the other fact that there are dozens of other women with their own unique and tragic stories of being drawn into polygamy so uh, he marries four young girls living with them. So many of these people that Joseph married were living or either in the quarters of Joseph Smith, 
the mansion home or like close by these people are not like just random citizens of Nauvoo he was marrying vulnerable people within his circle of influence and of course if you're the prophet of God then that puts pretty much everyone within your influence you can get people to do extraordinary things by um, by convincing them that God is the one behind all the decision making so Emma gives her reluctant uh, acceptance for Joseph to marry the uh, Emily and Eliza Partridge, um, the, these sisters, and then the Sarah and Maria Lawrence, another pair of sisters who, again, I believe are younger than 20 years old at the time, or in their early 20s maybe, um, they are Canadian orphans. These are orphan girls. I've, I've said so many commentaries now that like uh, so many of the people in polygamy were uh, didn't really have another choice. They needed to have support and I think in this case it says they had some inheritance money so may not have been the case for them but still it's just these stories are just the more you read about it the more um, disheartening it is this chapter by itself would probably disillusion almost everyone that has a um, faithful testimony about Joseph Smith you may come to the conclusion that at the end of the day his um, prophecy was still powerful and meaningful and in that you still want to be a member of the church but I think anyone who reads the first-hand accounts of these women and what they went through will come away um, quite moved uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 132 of course uh, it's just crazy the penalty for Emma's disobedience is put forth by God himself. But if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed. For I am the Lord thy God and will destroy her if she abide not in my law. There's this huge binary that talks is talked about a lot in the Book of Mormon. In, uh, in the narrative of First Nephi, where the prophet Nephi and their family are trying to escape Jerusalem, one of the things that one of the themes is that Nephi is better than his brothers Laman and Lemuel because he um, follows the commandments. He's obedient, and uh, his brothers are not obedient, and therefore they're going to be cursed. And so you see that pattern a lot in Mormon theology, and it's pretty clear. It's pretty clearly spelled out here as well on DNC one thirty two. Emma, you can accept Joseph having as many wives as he wants and taking as many virgins under his wing as he wants you can accept that and i will bless him and you a hundredfold in this world and in the world of the next but if you don't let joseph do literally whatever he wants despite the fact that it is absolutely actively breaking your heart in pieces uh, then i will destroy you i am inclined to think that the better argument in terms of debating active believing mormons is to stop trying to prove that god doesn't exist I think a better argument is to just concede that, at least f for the sake of debate, God exists. But why would you want to worship a God? Like, what, what purpose would it bring to your life to worship a God that is so vindictive and so awful in so many ways to provide this sort of mafia boss uh, an offer you can't refuse? It says that uh, people were quick to say that Emma was given the opportunity to use her agency to consent to this law of polygamy and that it is spelled out in DNC 132 that a man cannot take other virgins as his wife unless the first wife gives prior consent. But again, it's the same thing. But if she doesn't consent, then they're screwed. So that's you can't have active consent if the consequence of you saying no to a offer is a supreme punishment um then th then you do not have the opportunity to give um your full enthusiastic consent the only way for you to have safe informed consent is if someone gives you the choice between two or more options and there are equal positive and negative consequences for each action taken. If only one of the options you're given when you're cho given the choice between multiple options, if only one of those options um, is positive, uh, then you know you're going to choose that option, and it's not fair. It's it's really disgusting. Um, 
I think it is incredible, as it says, incredible as it may seem, the book, the bulk of the Mormon colony, which now numbered more than 15,000 in and about the city, knew little or nothing of polygamy. In particular, the English converts, now numbering over 4,000 in Nauvoo, were kept in ignorance. We are talking about thousands of people that have emigrated across the entire Atlantic Ocean to come to Nauvoo, and they are being, and the people in England did figure out, if I remember correctly, there were people begging people not to join the church saying these are polygamists these men will take your daughters and and put them into polygamy and they saw it for what it was and uh, they still were able to convert thousands of people many of them young impoverished women to come to Nauvoo and it is staggering that they were able to keep this such a secret it makes you wonder how many other secrets in our society are being held uh, probably more than we care to admit. Um, of course, there are people like Edward Snowden and Julian Assange who are in prison or, or who would be in prison, um, but are, are fugitives from the United States government for telling the world uh, about the ways, the, the lies that we've been told about our government and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's really astonishing to see that there are thousands of people in Nauvoo when all of this is going down. John C. Bennett launches his expose against the church, and it's still not enough to convince, like, the entire sentiment of the church to turn against Joseph Smith. Just really, the amount of information control that w must have been present is really staggering. Joseph pulls the... There is never but one on earth at a time whom the power and keys are conferred. Uh, he uses that all the time. Mostly he's used it to um, stifle other revelations. So there's the, he comes back from Canada and there's the woman that has her own seer stone and she's pronouncing her own prophecies. And then he says, nope, only one prophet at a time. God called me, you're a false prophet. Uh, and there was a there was a time in Kirtland when s similar situations people Oliver Cowdery and other people were having their own revelations he had to shut it down because it's too dangerous and he does that again here so uh, he says polygamy doesn't exist but if it does <laughs> I'm the only one that gets to authorize it because I'm the prophet of God there's this funny excerpt from this poem that was published in the Warsaw message of Buckeye's lamentation for want of more wives uh, I thought that was pretty fun to read what was not fun is this uh, anecdote about Eliza Snow so she wakes up in the morning and they go outside into the the hallway and she is met by Joseph who pulls her into a sweet uh, embrace at the exact moment that Emma Smith also comes out and sees this now uh, Eliza is basically her best friend Emma and Eliza are very close Emma trusted her above all other people Eliza Snow was one of the presidents of the Relief Society um, it's a really tragic story and of course Emma kind of um, flips her lid and goes nuts and goes and assaults Eliza and it says that the results of this assault where she ends up stumbling and falling down the stairs resulted in a miscarriage and it's believed by Fawn Brody. I don't know if it's proven but it, there's evidence to suggest that Eliza Snow's uh, miscarriage would have been Joseph's child were it, um, were it uh, born into this world. So a truly a truly devastating experience for everyone that witnessed it. Um, it's just, all of this is just so devastatingly sad. It is so sad that all of these women, um, and men too, uh, it's not just the women, it's, it's, it's Anakin Skywalker, it's not just the women, but the men and the women and the children. Um, but truly, um, this is really 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 sad and of course there are people like Jedediah Grant who come up with the apologetic you know Joseph wasn't really wanting every man's wife the grand object in view was to try the people of God to see what was in them and again I'm I don't even care I personally don't think God exists or at least not the God that Joseph Smith was praying to but um, conceding for sake of argument that God does exist, why would you want to worship a God that allows Joseph Smith to, to do this kind of behavior? To, and not only to get away with it, but to be praised as the best moral exemplar since Jesus himself. This is lunacy. It is 
ridiculous to think that Joseph Smith is a moral exemplar. And these stories just make you more angry the more you read about it. And this is absolutely just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think the book that most people recommend is a book called In Sacred Loneliness. And that is a book that I'll recommend. And that talks about um, a much wider scope of the tragedy of polygamy as it existed in Nauvoo before Nauvoo and then as it carried on to the Salt Lake uh, period under Brigham Young because polygamy expanded and many of the more horrific anecdotes of polygamy exist after this book. They aren't even covered in this book, but what is covered in this book is enough on its own to convince most readers that this was a really seriously tragic event and a series of events that took place in this part of Mormon history. It's a scar that the Mormons will never be able to heal from completely and uh, polygamy will be for the rest of human history the the primary thing Mormons are associated with and I suppose that's a fitting punishment for Joseph Smith that he got what he wanted and now the missionary efforts of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are forever hampered by the negative association people have with this barbarous practice of polygamy at, that is lined out in Doctrine and Covenants section 132. Uh, Fawn Brody finishes the chapter by saying it may be that evidence of other children born to Joseph lies buried among the manuscripts in the church library in Salt Lake City. And that very well may be true. The access of documents that we have is limited in the sense that there is probably stuff deep within the Salt Lake uh, vaults of the church that we don't know. It wasn't until the 2010s that they officially unveiled the peep stone that Joseph used, uh, the seeing stone that was involved in the translation of the Book of Mormon, because for decades in the 20th century they denied that Joseph Smith had one, and then once it became in unfeasible for them to continue that course of revisionist history, they decided to do a more transparent um, gaslighting approach. Well, we've always been transparent. What do you mean? We have made no attempt to hide anything, which is very um, obviously not true. The internet has exposed Mormonism and its very many cover-ups. Um, so are there good things in the religion? Certainly, but uh, the one thing that is not good is the way that the church has obfuscated its the narrative of its history and provided a correlated uh, whitewashed history that is what I was taught growing up about the church. Reading this book I think is so interesting because it makes so abundantly clear the many ways in which the that narrative uh, falls apart the more you dig into it. So the next chapter we're going to learn about Joseph Smith's political ambitions and his eventual uh, candidacy for President of the United States. And you're maybe wondering how he jumped from just like the leader of a western frontier town to a political candidate on the federal level but um that's just the kind of guy we're talking about joseph smith if there were anyone that thought he could do it it was joseph so very interesting we'll see you then